Welcome back. <laughs> yes, we, we have ignition. We have lunch. Hope you had a great Christmas break. We are now delving into electricity. So first semester, you know, we did mechanics. We learned about dynamics. Mechanics happens to or it includes dynamics. Dynamics and why things move, you know, the, the laws of physics that related to motion. And then we moved in into we got to waves and things like that. And now we're going to electricity. Now, a, a quick, 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 quick thing about the syllabus. The syllabus is virtually the same as it was last semester with just a couple differences. Difference number one is for lab, we will not meet every week for lab this semester. For instance, we will meet tomorrow, but the week after that, it will be group project day number one. And if you have your group together, now we have 10 people, so we'll have three groups, two groups of three and one group of four. <clears throat> if you have your group defined and I've already approved your project, you do not need to come to lab next week. That's time set aside for you to work on your lab project. You don't have to work during that time, but that gives you release time for you to apportion as fits to everyone's schedule. And so we'll have at least two, I think three lab periods where we don't meet so that you have time to work on your project. You don't have to just make time outside of the normal schedule. Um, that lab project is going to culminate with the last week of school. You will have a poster that you create and give a verbal presentation where you show it working and you explain the physics behind why it works. Your projects have to be over topics that we covered this semester. So electricity, magnetism, optics, nuclear, those are the realm of your, your topics. So something to start thinking about now, just, you know, get your ideas, who you want to work with, what you guys want to do. And, you know, like I said, I have to prove the topic to make sure it's not too difficult and not too easy. I, I had a group a couple of years ago, I don't know if they think I just, you know, fell off the turnip truck, but they said, you know, we were thinking maybe we could make a, a spectrometer with a pizza box and, and a little diffraction grading. I'm like, yeah. You could do that in like, I don't know, 30 minutes. They go to general chemistry lab. <laughs> you know, it needs to be something that's a little more robust. Um, second thing is field trip. Yay, we have a field trip. The Nebraska Academy of Sciences is a, a scientific conference that occurs every year at Nebraska Wesleyan University just down the road. And they have... It's for students. You have students, both undergraduate and graduate students, giving presentations about their research projects. And so it gives you exposure to how scientists communicate. They communicate, obviously, by writing articles, but also by giving talks at presentations, you know, conferences, or by posters. <coughs> and as you'll see, I didn't realize this until I was a teacher that in some disciplines they read papers at a conference. At scientific conference, you don't read a paper. It's expected that everyone that's there can read. But you give a presentation where you talk about things. <laughs> um, and so it'll give you a chance to see how scientists communicate. And I think it's very valuable. It's, it's an all-day conference. You will have specific things you have to do that will take approximately two hours. So you can come all day or you can choose just the time you need. Any questions about that? I do want to make sure it's on everyone's radar that you don't like, what? Nobody told me there was a field trip in this class. Okay, electricity. When was electricity discovered? I don't know. So I have here as early as 600 BC. Just to make sure we're all on the same page, what does 600 BC mean? Before Christ. Okay, 600 years before the birth of Christ. Um, yeah, people were trying to take out Christ from uh, the way we labeled the years. It was actually about 500 and some years 
I think that's right, 564 years, something like that, after the time of Christ when this whole designation came about, which seems odd because who could come up with that today? No one would adopt it. But a lot of people talk about CE for common era and BCE or before common era. Common era means after the birth of Christ. Before common era means before the birth of Christ. It's still based on the birth of Christ, but they take Christ out of the names. Um, otherwise, we use BC for before Christ, very literally, AD for Anno Domini, which is the year of our Lord. <clears throat> okay, so as early as 600 years before the birth of Christ, there was this thing known as charge. Now, you actually have very broad experience with a type of charge. But the type of charge you have experience with, no one calls charge. And that is mass. The charge is the thing that the force depends on. And the force of gravity depends on mass. And so mass would be a gravitational charge. You might remember I said there's actually two masses. There's gravitational mass and there's inertial mass. But as far as we know, they're exactly the same in value. So nobody worries about slowing them up. But the gravitational mass would be a charge if you want to be all technical-like. So in 1600, now, of course, in 1600, that's 1600 A.D., Domini. The phenomenon was named after the Greek word for amber, which is electron. So electron is just the Greek word for amber. Now, talk about how this came about. If you take, I, every year I'm like, I'm going to get some new fur. This used to be fur that was, you know, part of a pelt. Now, not so much. If you take this and you rub it, then something strange happens. I don't have much hair, so I don't know if it'll do anything to my hair. Um, but if you take, hey, there is no pith ball on this. Number two better have a game. So you have that little pith ball, and I rub this on the fur. And if I do it right, I should be able to bring it up and see I can make it move. If I made it move, what did that mean I did? I placed a... A force on it, something that pushes or pulls. In this case, it was pushing it away, right? And so there's some kind of force involved here. And it turns out, let's see, get this baby out. This here is called the electroscope. This vein here can freely rotate. It's not quite pinned at the center, so it hangs vertically. And if I bring this up here, you see I can... Do some stuff to make, okay, it's, it's doing a little motion on its own, which takes away from, you can see I made a move when I bring it up here. And then if I touch it, and notice I'm rubbing it all along here for a reason we'll find out later. Now it's not hanging vertically anymore. So that means whatever I had on this that was causing the force, I was able to pass on to that metal. So people like Ben Franklin said, the charge, the thing that's causing this force, must be a fluid because it flows. Remember, fluids are things that flow. And then Ben Franklin said randomly, the stuff that we have on the amber, of course this is rubber instead of amber, the stuff that we have on the amber rod, we'll call that electrons, because amber is electron in Greek. And he said, let's, let's give it a negative number. Let's say we have a negative charge. Now, why would you give it a negative number? Remember, with mass, we don't have negative mass, do we? But they discovered that if you take a piece of glass and you rub the glass on silk, not <laughs> sure it's polyester, not silk, um, it will do the opposite thing that you had when you rubbed the amber on fur. And so they said, it does the opposite thing. You must have two different types of charge. It's a dipole instead of a monopole. And so with the dipole, you have to have a way to differentiate the two. And they said, let's call one positive and one negative. And the one in the amber rod is negative. 
Now, it turns out with our current understanding that atoms are made up of three types of particles. What are those types of particles? You all know them. Protons, neutrons, and electrons. And so with stuff being made of protons, neutrons, and electrons, the protons and neutrons are in the nucleus of an atom. This is not groundbreaking anyone, right? You've all taken chemistry? So the protons and neutrons are in the nucleus of an atom, and in a solid, we talk about the different states of matter. In the solid, the atoms are fixed in place. So the protons are fixed in place. They don't move. The electrons, though, if the electrons are in what we call the valence band, those electrons can, well, actually better be a little more careful, in the conduction band when you have a crystal, then those electrons can move. And so the electrons move, the nuclei don't. And so is there a fluid? Technically, the electrons are behaving like a fluid, like water is a fluid. Water is a fluid because you have the molecules moving. The electrons are moving, same idea. So <clears throat> in 1729, and as you get older, these dates don't seem as far back as they do when you're young. You know, 1729, I'm now like, I'm not just a few years before the United States became a country. And you're like, yeah, more than you know, almost 300 years ago. Things were classified as conductors or insulators. These things here are both insulators. Now, some people might be confused because what did I do with each of these two objects? I rubbed them and, and they became charged. So that means I had electrons. This one gained electrons. When I rubbed it with the fur, electrons left the fur and went onto the rod. And when I rubbed my shirt with this, electrons went from the glass onto my shirt. So I transferred electrons in both cases, and yet we call these insulators. So what does insulator mean? All right? You say? Um, like Whenever we talk about insulators, we always talk about insulating heat or cold. To keep heat from, or from, escaping. from from flowing. Right? An insulator is something that stops the flow. You can, you know, your insulator can gain, it, it can be hot and have thermal energy, or it can be cold and have low thermal energy. Just like the insulator, it can have excess electrons or it can have missing electrons but the electrons can't easily move along it. So that's why when I was taking this and touching this thing, I slid it around because this had excess electrons, but I need to bring those excess electrons into contact with that metal for them to move off. I can't touch here and have electrons that were at this location go off the end because it's an insulated electrons. You can have excess or you can have missing, but they can't move around. Whereas for a conductor, I just have this because it's a piece of metal. A conductor, the electrons can move fairly freely. What you have in the conductor is, in case you guys know a little about electron configurations. In a conductor, when you put a whole bunch of atoms together, those energy levels that you learn about, like the hydrogen atom has energy levels, minus 13.6 electron volts, or take that divided by two squared, divided by four squared, you get all those different levels. If you put more atoms together, you start to have slightly different energy levels because you have a whole bunch of different atoms. And if you put billions and billions together, you start to have a band of energies where the electrons are instead of just one level. And if it turns out that the, the valence electrons you have exactly fill that band, then it's an insulator. But if they fill like half of that band, then it's a conductor because electrons can have virtually no energy increase and then they're free to move to any other, any other atom because you've got this band of allowed energies. So it all comes down to what you learn in general chemistry about, and we'll learn this in physics too later on, about energy levels. So a conductor, it takes virtually no energy to make the charge move. Insulator, the charge can't move unless you give it a huge amount of energy. Now, 
it's time for me to have fun, I think. Where's my pin? <laughs> Here it is. I think it's time to have fun. Um, I've already talked about all of this. Oh, and I should talk about this before we have fun too. Net charge of closed system never changes. One of our rules, our conservation rules, is the conservation of charge. We've already learned from thermodynamics, first law of thermodynamics, energy cannot be created or destroyed. For electricity, we have electric charge cannot be created or destroyed. Now, there's a conservation law that you probably learned in chemistry that's false. How many people have heard of conservation of mass? Okay, a couple. That's not true. Mass is not conserved. You can create mass and destroy mass. Einstein was the person who came up with that famous equation, P equals mc squared. What that's saying is mass is a form of energy, and you can convert energy into mass or mass into energy. And we'll, we'll learn about that later. But mass is not conserved. Charge is. Charge is conserved if you create, you can create an electron. You can have a photon, that's a particle of light, that gives up its energy and creates an electron, but it also has to create an anti-electron, something that's exactly like an electron, but has a positive charge. So the charge remains conserved, but mass didn't. Okay, we're going to do some playing here before I just run out of time, because, I mean, what good would physics class be without playing? So this here is called the Van de Graaff generator. For lab tomorrow, one group is going to explain how the Van de Graaff generator works. So I won't go into detail on it, but this actually belongs to the high school because mine's broken. I need to buy a new one. This does have an electric motor. You can buy them with a hand crank so people don't think there's some kind of flim flam going on. All the electric motor is doing is causing this wheel to rotate. So down here, there's a nylon wheel with a rubber, piece of rubber that goes around it. And that rubber, see down here, there's a piece of metal that just goes to this box, the chassis. The rubber comes up here, and there's this little wire up here that connects to this metal that's gonna to touch this globe. And what this does is it transports charge like a conveyor belt, actually, I put this on here just so I don't end up doing something stupid, sticking my finger in a wheel. That's pretty much the purpose of this. So A, you don't stick your finger in a wheel, and B, you don't touch across the 120 volts coming out of the wall. So it's basically a conveyor for charge, conveyor belt for charge. It brings charge up to the top. And so if I plug it in, it's going to make a lot of noise, and it's going to bring charge up to the top. What did we see about charge here? Or what did I say about charge? It causes, it causes, a force. It causes a force. So there's going to be something here that's causing a force, and we're going to see what kind of ramifications it will have for us. So, come on. I can plug it in. Trust me, I've done this before. First thing you know is it's starting to make sound, besides just the conveyor belt. What would you call that sound? Okay, she said shocks, arcing. It's electricity going through the air. It's electrons going through the air. Why? Because this conveyor belt put a bunch of electrons on the top. And if you put a bunch of electrons on the top, you're getting a lot of energy because those electrons are applying a force on each other. And so if I come out here, I can make it arc to my hand. Electricity. Yes, it, it messes stuff up. In fact, usually I try to keep my phone away from this because, you know, safety principles. So what's going on here is electrons are passing from that globe into my hand. It hurts a little, by the way, just so you know. But I do this because I want my students to understand what's going on. In fact, we should turn off the lights just, you know. So we have the best possible viewing experience. Also, if I mute that, we won't see it 
quicker. So you see the electricity going between my hand and that. What are you actually seeing? Any idea? Hot tip, you're not seeing electrons. What was that? <laughs> oh, she said it's cold. Okay, well, what you're seeing... Got it? It's related to that. The electrons have a very large amount of kinetic energy when they leave it. They're going really fast. They collide with molecules in the air, and they have what we call knock-on um, excitation, where the electrons will transfer some energy to electrons in the atoms. They may ionize the atom, they kick an electron off the atom, and they just raise the electron to a higher energy level. But then the electrons fall back down to lower energy levels, and to give off light in the process. So what you're seeing is actually the atoms in the atmosphere, or the molecules in the atmosphere, giving off energy after they've been excited by the electrons going through. Now, I want to explore some physics with this. So I have here some tinfoil plates. Tinfoil is metal. Metals are conductors. The electrons can move through and through them. So if this has a bunch of excess electrons on it, I'm going to actually <clears throat> unplug. One last shock. Now that's close to discharge. My body is kind of like a reservoir for electrons. It can take on a lot of electrons. It can give off a lot. But I did probably raise my body's total charge level to above neutral as I have excess electrons now. And so if I, if I touch Andy, there's a chance that wasn't enough for me to shop, but it could have had enough. Okay, so now that it's pretty much dead, I'm going to put these on here. They sit on here. When I plug it in, we're going to have electrons come up. Okay, I'm telling you we're going to have electrons come up. Tomorrow, the people who are doing this for lab will be definitive if it's electrons, excess electrons on the top, or if it's missing electrons on the top. Either one would work the same as far as we're concerned. And so I'm just saying it's excess electrons without having checked. But if there's excess electrons on here and these are conductors, what's going to happen to the excess electrons? They're going to go through the conductive material. Okay, they're going to go through the conductive. So all of these plates are going to have excess electrons. Then we're going to see what happens. Okay, so they came off. So if I had excess electrons on one pi tin and excess electrons on the, another pi tin, what kind of force did I have between those two pi tins? Repulsive. So there's one of our rules for the electric force. Light charges repel. And it turns out the converse is true, that opposite charges attract. So positive attracts negative, negative repels negative. What would positive do to positive? Just want to make sure we understand, lights rebel, opposites trap. Now, another thing you noticed, they didn't all fly off at once. Only the top one flew off. Why was it just the top one that flew off? Like the Newton's cradle thing, it goes to the last one and knocks it off. Okay. Not exactly, but like, yeah. We had a repulsive force that's proportional to the charge on one and the charge on the other. If they all have the same charge, they all should have the same repulsive force. But how much downward force do I have on the top type of pi tin? The mass times gravity on one pin. Yeah. If I take the top two, what's the force downward? It's twice that, right? So the top one has the least downward force, hence the top one flies off. But when it flies off, you know, makes the next one so it all has just one. And so you just fly off one at a time because it's less force required to pick off one. Now let's try this with insulators. I have more paper, pl more plates, but these are styrofoam plates. What will happen if I put styrofoam plates on here and do the same thing? Okay. 
I've heard a couple answers. I heard, we're going to get closer. I heard nothing. Any others? Are they going to float? You know, this is science, physics. We have to do it, right? I'm just, really no other way. So we plug it in. It's thinking about it. It's thinking really hard. Nothing really, right? We're scientists. You ask, we do. It's the way it works. I really want it to blow. I want my Yeah. Okay. What was different? It made glass. Okay. The, the second time, yes. Yes. But there's actually a different difference as well. But that's okay. the difference between the metal and the styrofoam first. What's uh, conductor, conductor and the other things? One's a conductor, one's an insulator, and it made a significant difference. With the conductor, the charge went all the way through them, so they all had the charge distributed. With the insulator, only the one that's touching is going to have charge transferred to it. The others aren't going to, because the charge that transfers to this is going to be stuck wherever it was put. So if we had one, that one flew off because it took on the same charge as the globe. But the one above it didn't. So there was no repulsion between the ones above. And if you have enough weight, yeah, it's going to hold you down. So what have we learned here? We've learned about charge. Charge is conserved. If we have a conductor, the charge can move through it with virtually no energy loss, or energy cost, I should say. If it's an insulator, you can put charge on it or take it off, but the charge can't move about. So, let's just move on now. Sorry, let me turn on the projector as well. Assuming it still works. Yeah. Can you explain the second part again? Um, the charge can't move with the insulator, but... Um, okay, so an insulator, the definition of an insulator is it takes an enormous amount of energy to make charge move. Right, so you can put charge on or take charge off, but you can't make it move through it. And you see our electric fun has messed with something. So we try power cycling this first. We usually think about electricity going through wires or through direct contact. But there was no direct contact between this and that switch. So how can it do anything? Okay, the air clearly was conducting charge, and it was creating something that we call an electric field. An electric field is a force field due to the electric charge. We also have good familiarity with a force field. Have I ever used force field in this class? I could have initially to set this up, but I don't remember. But a force field is something that is used to calculate the force on something that comes into the force field. So the electric field is used to calculate the force on something that comes into a region of electric charge. We say the same thing with gravitational force. We had gravitational charge, and if something comes into the vicinity of that gravitational charge, it would have a force, and we calculated that force field, and we called it the Acceleration of gravity. Acceleration of gravity was our gravitational force field. Question. Um, did you use force field in um, electric field? Interchangeably? Um, an electric field is an example of a force field. A magnetic field is an example of a force field. A gravitational, you know, acceleration of gravity is an example of a gravitational force field. Okay, so electric chart. Work has been done, work by people like J.J. Thompson. Well, J.J. Thompson found the charge to mass ratio, and then Millikan was able to find the, the amount of basic charge. He found that charge comes in discrete units. 
we call it, if it comes to discrete units, we call it quantized. So charge is quantized, it comes in discrete units, and those discrete units, as worked out with the combined work of Millikan and Thompson, is that an electron has a charge of 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Coulomb, that's Charles de Augustine Coulomb's last name. Um, so our basic unit of charge is the Coulomb. And, boy, I have to go back and check with the changes they made this summer to see if Coulomb is a fundamental unit or if Ampere is a fundamental unit. Up at least until last year at this time, the Ampere was the fundamental unit and the Coulomb was a derived unit. Even though it seems like the Coulomb should be the fundamental unit because that's the amount of charge on an electron. That seems like it's fundamental to me. But every electron has that charge. Now, of course, electrons, according to Ben Franklin, have a negative charge. So an electron has that number with the negative sign for its charge. So if we use the symbol E, E means the magnitude of the charge on the electron. So the charge of the electron is minus E. So that's the charge of the electron. Notice the 10 to the minus 19. The charge of an electron is really tiny in coulombs. In fact, almost everything we do is going to be small charges. We're going to be dealing with problems that have has charge in generally one of those three. What does N stand for? Nano, or 10 to the minus 9. What does the Greek letter mu stand for? Micro, or 10 to the minus 6. And M, lowercase m, milli, 10 to the minus 3. We're usually going to have charges in those ranges because those are kind of typical sizes of charge. Question? So does a proton have like a charge of 1.6 to 10 to the positive 19? That is correct. Charge comes quantized, and it turns out that it's always 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19. So a proton is positive 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19. An electron is minus 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19. And now I'll show you that I'm a liar. If you turn around and look back here, I have a chart of the fundamental particles. And the last week of the semester, we should get to this, we have these things we call quarks. Quarks is actually a nonsense word from J.J. Joyce's, or J.J. Joyce, I don't know, it's not by Joyce's, um, story, Finnegan's Wake. And they decide to call the things that protons and neutrons are made out of quarks. I, I now I can't remember his name suddenly. Um, Murray Delmont decided to call them quarks. And so the quarks, the first two quarks are called the up and the down. Everything that we interact with is either made of electrons or ups or downs. And so an up, up, down is a proton. An up, down, down is a neutron. So they're made of quarks. And now we have a problem. We said that the fundamental charge is 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Well, how do we get zero charge for up, down, down, and one electron charge for up, up, down? The answer is the charge of an up is plus 2 thirds E. And the charge for a down is minus 1 third E. I lied, right? Charge doesn't always come in integer multiples of E, except we are not able to find naked quarks. Quarks are always found either with a quark anti quark pair or three quarks together, making what we call a baryon, since it's protons and neutrons. Or you can have things that are like five quarks or you know, there's, there's some other variations that are really high energy. But the combinations that we actually find in nature always have an energy charge. So while we believe we have these subatomic particles, the quarks, they come in partial integer charges. The actual things that we ever interact with always come in integer multiples of that charge. So that information I just gave you based on that table not going to be necessary to know until the final exam. So for now, charge always comes in integer multiples of that number. 
And I did not check to see if that number changed this summer. If it changed, it would be somewhere out like here. Because remember, they changed all of our units over the summer. Okay, so here are the basic particles everything's made out of. Protons have a mass of 1.673 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms, or roughly one atomic mass unit. Neutrons have almost exactly the same mass. Notice it's 1.675 instead of 1.673 kilograms. And electrons have a much smaller mass of 9.109 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. These we could call the gravitational charge. Because the gravitational force depends on those numbers. Go ahead, Claudia. Do we need to know those numbers? No. Um, you do not have to have them memorized, no. And then we have the electric charge, Q. Q is our new symbol for charge. What else has Q stood for? Most recently, heat. And just before that, flow rate. Now it's charge. You, as we go on, we find that we start reusing letters of the alphabet. So we have to be careful and know what our equations are relating to, rather than just randomly find an equation that has a symbol with the right letter. Another thing that comes up that nobody really um, behaves with, lowercase q technically means that it can change. Capital Q technically means it can't. But nobody really pays attention to that. So lowercase q or capital Q, we'll pretty much use them interchangeably. So the charge of a proton is plus E, charge of an electron is minus E, charge of a neutron, zero. I have a problem. I actually want you to do this without me doing anything beforehand to solve a problem because, well, it's not that hard. So if I... If I'm just walking around, this just happened yesterday, walking around and I pass something to a person, sometimes I shock them, right? The amount of charge that's transferred in that is about one nanocoulomb. And so the question here is, if the charge is transferred by electrons only, how many electrons are transferred for one nanocoulomb? So at your table, and you should probably join the max there, cool. calculate how many electrons are in one nanocoulomb. And just to make life easier,
<laughs> so how are we doing? Okay, we'll see if, if Sarah's right. I'll get to the end. You can just say yes. So this is, you, you never see an explicit equation for this. The textbooks always assume, oh, the students have the, you know, the reasoning skills to put this together. And so I gave it to you for you to work on those reasoning skills, but now let's make sure that we know how to think this through. So what we have is Q equals the number of electrons multiplied by the charge of an electron. And I'm just using absolute values so I don't worry about any my sites. And we want to find the number of electrons. So that's just going to be Q divided by the charge of an electron. So that's one nanocoulomb, that's 10 to the minus nine coulombs. And the charge of an electron, 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19. So that's going to be, okay, 10 to the minus nine divided by 10 to the minus 19 is 10 to the 10th. So it's 10 over, well, it's one over 1.62 times 10 to the 10th, which is about 6 times 10 to the ninth. Is that roughly what you got? I'm just going to get it reversed. Yeah, I also have it reversed. Is that one for the first? Or can it be like six times ten? Is there like adding a nine? Well, start with this equation. The total charge is equal to the number of electrons multiplied by the charge of each electron. And so then if I want to solve for n, the number of electrons alone, I just divide both sides by E. And so, shoot, I'll do it on the calculator. That's going to be 6.24 times 10 to the moon. Nine, yeah. 6.24 would be the correct. So to one sig fig, six times 10, times 10 plus nine electrons. Now, the second part of this question, if your body has a net charge of minus one nanocoulombs, how many extra electrons do you have percentage wise? We just determined you have an extra roughly six billion electrons. As a percentage of your total electrons, how much is that? How would you go about that calculation? Let's talk it through. How do you find the number of electrons your body has right now? You would go through the same process, except for Q, you would say make it one. Great. Well, first we need to find out how many electrons it has. So we know that following the assumptions here, for every proton plus neutron mass, we have one electron. So proton plus neutron mass, that's basically 1.67 times 2, or 1.67, that's 1 and 2 thirds. 1 and 2 thirds times 2 would be 3 and a third, I think. Um, 3 and a third times 2 minus 27 kilograms. So I take my body's mass. Let's be really generous and say my body's mass is 100 kilograms. That's less than I have. Um, so we take that 100 kilograms divided by roughly three and a third times 10 to the minus 27. And that's going to give us something on the ballpark of, let's say, three times 10 to the 27. Can you write that out? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, so first we'll do it right. So the mass of a proton plus the mass of a neutron is equal to if we just add these two numbers together, three point, it's gotta be 
roughly 3.35 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. And so given our, our hints, we have one electron for every 3.35 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. And so we have, and so I'm going to call that M1 is equal to that. So we have our mass is equal to, once again, the number of electrons in our body times mass one, the mass our body has for each electron. Actually, I'm going to, not going to call it any because I did any before. So I'll call that N1. Actually, it's 10 times more than the number I said. So 100 divided by 3.35 times 10 to the 27 is how many electrons my body should have. I have 3.35. And so that's, well, no. Yeah, well, I had three. The three is right. To one sig fig, that's three times 10 to the 28. Remember I said 27. So my body has three times 10 to the 28 electrons if I, if I have a mass of 100 kilograms. And so percentage excess six times 10 to the nine divided by three times 10 to the 28 times 100%, let's not forget that, gives us our percentage excess, which at this point, two times 10 to the minus, okay, nine minus 28 is minus 19, and multiply by 100, so minus 17. It's a very small percentage of excess electrons. What's the point of these? The point of these is, is actually working out with the logic and thinking about just how many electrons you have in your body, right? There's a lot of those things hanging around. Our last thing for today, Coulomb's force law. This is the equation that Charles D'Augustin Coulomb came up with for the force you have between two charges. Now, this is a vector equation, but I never, ever use it as a vector equation. I just write it as force between object one and object two is equal to K times charge of object one. I'll put the absolute value there times charge of object two absolute value divided by the separation between objects one and two squared. That's the magnitude of the charge. Does that equation? It should. Does it look familiar? What does it look like? looks like the gravitational force. Remember I was talking about the gravitational force. We had the gravitational charge of mass. The gravitational force had the equation that looked just the same, except for instead of K, we have G. Our constant has a different name and a different number. Separation squared, inverse, proportional to each of the two charges. They're exactly the same fundamentally. So everything we learned about gravitational force, we can now apply to electric force except for one additional complicating factor. Gravitational force is always attractive. Whereas with the electric force, it can be attractive or repulsive. So I write the magnitude equation and then I use my vector separately using the rule that if they have the same charge, it's repulsive. If they have opposite signs of the charge, then it's attractive. Okay, so we will end here and pick up in lab manana. So K stands for what? K. Okay, it's not there. It's somewhere here coming up. <laughs> Apparently, I wait a long time to define what K is. It's a constant. It's 9.89 times... Okay, I didn't even have it in the lecture. But it, it's charge. and Q is charge, yes. Think that's yes. So do we have a lab quiz? Um there will not be a lab quiz for